Uh, my name is Nuri. I'm going to be talking about uh, designing a uh, good schema uh, to get better results. Um, I've been a developer to start with, dealt a lot with back end or database or data structures, been doing a lot of data migrations lately, been doing a lot of C sharp in my career, also other programming languages, Python, JavaScript, stuff like that. Um, and since I've been around, I figured I put this talk together just to kind of share my experience about what worked uh, short term, what worked longer term. And this is really about uh, trying to optimize for longer term. So if I break down the uh, slide into what I'm really looking at, the use case scenario I'm kind of envisioning here is that uh, as a developer, I want a good schema that I won't regret later. And we've all been there, or maybe haven't, um, that we designed something, we thought it's great, we thought it's quick, we thought we fulfilled everything, just to find out that after delivering the first iteration or the first iteration into test or living with it for a year or five, uh, you discover all of these things, that all of these decisions that seemed right at the time and turned out not to be optimal. So breaking it down a little more, we have to ask ourselves, well, good schema sounds kind of qualifying. What is the word good? Like, what do I mean by that? Okay, that's a fair question. So the fitness criteria I'm looking for, I need to stay in this zone, because otherwise I'm walking off camera. Okay, it's here. Um, so the fitness criteria I'm looking for are roughly that the schema really wants to solve a business problem. Um, so what would be not a business problem? Like making my boss happy would not be a business problem. If it serves the customer, yes, it's a big, it's a business problem. But if it doesn't, it really doesn't belong in the things I need to solve. So you got to watch out for requirement creeps that tell you how to do things that has nothing to do with the real business problem you're solving. And within what you're solving for the real business, you want to make sure that it um, doesn't uh, scope creep into things that are not in the real world, that are internal technical things uh, that can creep in and pressure you to make schema decisions based on that, uh, that don't belong to solving. So it's the size of the actual word that I care about and the things that serve that uh, fit and the things that don't maybe a little less so. And the schema should be easy to reason with, right? Note the future self, I need to read this later. I need to communicate this with a team. I need everybody to be on the same page and understand it. I don't want something so convoluted that is so difficult to use. Um, one example of that, has anybody heard of EAV, Entity Attribute Value type schemas? One over there. Um, if we have time, I can go into this uh, big anti-pattern uh, for, for any kind of uh, medium to large scale. It's a way to represent things in a very flexible way in databases, schemas that were designed to be uh, rigid and uh, well-defined. Um, the disaster with that is that querying this thing in any kind of way is, is just uh, kind of horrific and convoluted and very difficult to reason with. And finally, I want it to be change tolerant. So in the um, interest of future self, I want to be able to evolve this as my product evolves, as our business case evolves, with a minimal set of impact. And I'm saying model, but we got to talk about this for a second, because that's a design thing. Model versus schema. So in the title, I put schema, and schema is very specific. Model, the real world is out there. It's, well, we're in it, right? We're right here. And this is the domain, this is the area in which we talk about models. So I can model a person. I can look at real world things about a person, their height, uh, how they're dressed, uh, their hair color, if they have any, uh, things like that. That was a joke, sorry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and then in the database world, when we're talking about stuff, we're talking about schema. We're talking really about the structures of how the data is actually stored. 
and that dictates how it would be processed. And the most important thing is the design. So the design is moving from the world, the real world, the model, into the schema. A model represents the uh, real world. Did you notice it looks like a smiley? I, I kind of liked it. Uh, a model represents the real world. Uh, so the model is looking at a person, looking at properties that I can see, looking at a, I don't know, an oil rig, a pipe, a whatever it is we represent, a catalog item is a product, right? So catalog item belongs into this idea that we have some kind of catalog. Maybe it's a real printable catalog, and there's items that I show in the brochure, and now I show it in the web, but that's representative of the real world. I pick out things that are observable about the thing I'm trying to represent. So a catalog item has uh, a name, and uh, I give it a name. It has some measurements, things like that. And it's the stuff I care about for business. So if I care about its weight, then it's in my model. And if I don't care about its weight, it's not in my model. As simple as that. Schema, on the other hand, schema implements the model. So once we came up with what we care about from the business perspective, from the real world, then we design, we can move into schema land. And schema land is where we get to speak a different language. Because when I say an item has a weight, there is no weight inside computer language. There's numbers. I can pick the right number for it or the right representation for whatever I'm trying to do. So I can say, oh, a weight is just a decimal representation of the weight in kilograms or in grams or in pounds or stone or whatever I want. But there is no weight inside SQL. SQL is its own language. So really, we're going to start translating things that in the real world were expressed in all of the terms we know in our own um, language of what we speak, speaking language, and translating it into schema in some way. And it describes an entity graph in that when we have things, and I have an item and I have a catalog, that's a graph, that's a representation of relationships between different things, a catalog item to a catalog, an invoice of you know, a piece of paper that details you know, the customer and the items they have in their shopping cart or stuff like that, their prices, the totals, all of these kind of things. So all of these things are relationships between things. And um, I just say this is a graph. This is a, a, a representation of nodes with connections between them. It can describe um, constraints on values. So that's a domain of schema. So when I say, hey, I have countries in the real world, that's in my model. In SQL, there is no countries data type. Right? There's a stringy data type, there's a numeric data type, there's all kinds of things. I can say, okay, well, you know, I'll store it in a char2 because I have ISO 2 letter codes for all countries. That would be called a domain. So it's a type, meaning car, char, varchar, whatever you want. And it has restrictions on what values it has. It doesn't have to be restriction. It could be looked as an allowance. But in any case, I'm describing that when I store this stuff, it better be in that domain. And some databases actually support this notion and allow you to declare a domain. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty, pretty rare to see that people really use domain. More likely, they're using what's called domain tables, which is just creating a table and saying, ah, this table is the universe of all values that could be ever used for a country. And your mileage may vary. I'm not talking about specific uh, database implementation here. So um, you, know, you may find that you want to use domains. You may find that you want to use the more generic uh, implementation of domain tables to restrict which values can go in. And finally, the schema layout 
will actually impact your performance. And this is where I recommend to not come to my talk, but go and hit the books, uh, talk to your DBAs, uh, go to courses, study on your own, read the manual, however you find a way to learn more about the implementation, the engine itself, how it works, uh, the better your performance will be. Because as it turns out, your schema could be uh, implemented, uh, you can de define tables with partitions, you can define various indexing strategies, clustered indexes, all kinds of things that will v uh, vastly improve your performance or uh, totally kill it, uh, depending on what choices you make. So this is where beyond the concept of schema and just saying using generic uh, DDL data definition language uh, to describe my tables and my uh, stuff, you can go in and use the optimizations that each engine provides for you in order to create, say, a partition table, in order to map partitions to files, files groups, things like that. Those kind of things, uh, if you get deep into it, can help you a lot. And those tend to fold in a lot more knowledge of not just the model, but how your use case is going to lay out on that. Meaning, how often are you going to access things, uh, at what rate, how much data you expect, things like that. And the main thing is, I don't want to regret it, right? I don't want to make things that, decisions today, that I will regret tomorrow. So the question is, what will I regret tomorrow? I can tell you a few things I regretted. Uh, one is, things were way too complicated. Too complicated, I, I did the EAV model once, regretted it wholeheartedly. It's a complex way to represent flexible objects, and relational databases are just not built for that. So every query and everything we wanted to do was an uphill battle. Downtime, when changes were too vast, when I needed to make a change and it required me to take the database offline and therefore the applications that talk to it offline, that's very painful. And just lots of work. If the changes uh, are possible but just require a ton of work, that's big investment, that's more planning, that's more involvement of more people, that's harder to roll into production. So those are all regrettable decisions. So in terms of work, I kind of put together this thing, and um, it, it, it's DB engine specific, but I think it's worth staring at for a little bit. Um, I tried to say, well, how do we break down what is the impact of change? If I want to change something, what does it involve? So in terms of DDL, and we're talking about the data definition language, how my tables are declared, what do I declare? I declare that there is a table or there isn't, right? Create a table, okay, that's cheap. Just create a new table. Nobody used it before. What's my dependencies on other? Mm, just about zero, right? I can do that all day. But if I drop a table, I gotta ask myself, hey, was this table involved with anybody else? Was it part of a graph with other things? In which case, you know, there may be a little more impact or high impact, depending on how, uh, how interconnected, how many foreign keys it has to other things. So dropping a table and creating a table not the same, and dropping a table that has strings and tentacles to other stuff more expensive. Adding a column with a null value, generally considered a zero-cost operation. Populating it with values can take a little more. Huge, huge tables, even more. But still, it's within the realm of kind of easy, right? But if this was involved with other uh, key constraints, if the column uh, was involved in uh, some constraints, then we have to take more care. It's not a zero-time operation on large tables. When you manipulate columns that participate in foreign key, that's where your complexity suddenly starts. That's where interconnectivity uh, shows up, and then you may have cascading updates in other places, so that costs more. Um, talking about dropping a column, kind of similar to dropping a table that has that column because it all has to do with these interconnected with this graph of objects that 
interact with each other. And finally, changing a column type. Um, it kind of depends if your uh, column types uh, become, um, uh, if, if, if you had a numeric that was too narrow and you widened it, you're really more accommodating. If you're taking a type and changing it completely, it was string and now it's an int. Anybody that treated it before as string and wanted to parse it now has to worry about it. So that's a more sweeping change. Um, and then if you're narrowing something, if you're taking something that was open and making it more restrictive, uh, then uh, again, you have to worry about everybody that was using it, making sure their math isn't harmed, making sure your data didn't lose precision without you knowing and intending to do that. So it's kind of good, I think, to map the impact of the changes I anticipate or the changes I uh, might experience as a result of changing constraints uh, to map it mentally to like what's the cost of this change. And if you start with that, then when you're designing, you say, okay, I'm doing this decision. Now what if I had to change it? What changes can happen to it? And based on that, I can try to project, well, is it advisable to do today? So based on what I just said, I would start with seven-ish kind of areas that I marked as uh, uh, errors or things to know or things to do that might make your life better. Opaque data types. Opaque data types are data types that don't represent a single thing or don't represent anything for the database itself. A composed string can be an opaque data type. If I have full name as a field in my database, or a column in my database, I should say, and I always treat it as just full name. My database is just for label printing. I put in the name. It's part of the address. It's full name. It's just a thing that appears on the line. I never care if it's Nuri Halperin or Bob uh, Smith or Jane J. Smith or whatever it is doesn't matter. But it becomes an opaque data type if in my business requirements, I need to then go and sort it by last name. Because the database has no idea that within this string, there's some spaces and they mean something, and then that the p last part of it is actually the last name. And sometimes last names are multi-word last names, so actually counting and going to the last is not going to work. And the database has no idea about it, right? The database is just varchar and varchar, right? As programmers, we think string, but same thing. The database, the, even in string, it's opaque because it has multiple parts. So doing that uh, messes you up later. It's better if you know that there are constituents to a thing to break it apart into its constituents. Blob, for the same reason, a blob is something that maybe doesn't have delimiters naturally in it or that they are not even attainable within uh, the SQL language. Uh, a byte string uh, would be um, a good example for that where um, you know, it, it's just a sequence of bytes and sure, in programming, I know how to scroll in and use protobufs and hop into the right byte to extract a field from it. But as far as the database is concerned, it's a blob. Image data, JPEGs inside the database. I, I never not regretted putting binary data in a database. Like, there's an app for that. It's called the file system. It's called buckets. Store the pointer. Those are things for, th those are infrastructure for these things in the database, keep things that are relational, that are property, that are processable, processable with logical operators. I can't say image one greater than ima image two. Makes no sense. I can't scroll in there and even tell you if it's an exif, a jfif, or a gif, or a gif. Can't say any of that, just don't know. And JSON and XML suffer some, from some stuff that is very similar, except as humans, we can say, oh, what do you mean? I understand these delimiters, but the database doesn't. So don't do that. 
incorrect data types, you know, dates as strings is the most often seen one in my experience. Um, it's just using the database uh, to store seemingly flexible uh, data type uh, or just shuttling it from the front end and having no marshalling so I can show it as a string. Uh, again, the database doesn't know how to compare it correctly. At best, you will do an ISO representation that is canonical and you can do comparisons of greater or less than, but then you'll have to break it apart, look at constituent of the time, time zone offset, things like that. Ugly stuff. There is a database, data type for that and the database knows how to do things like extract the time zone, the minute, the second, the whatever, from proper date types. So use the proper date type. And finally, non-domain values. It's not something you do in your DDL so much, but if in your column you're going to shove some random value that is not from your domain, like you have all country codes, and then you represent country code zero for all of those that are, you don't know the country code. That's wrong. And putting null is also not something from the domain. Null, is it a type? Is it a value? It's not a value, it's a type, right? And it doesn't belong to the country codes. There is no country in the world that is null, right? So it's a non-domain value. And non-domain values mean that the database doesn't know that it doesn't belong there, so all comparisons are going to run against it as if it's just part of the domain. But in fact, it isn't, and you will have to write extra logic to handle it everywhere. So don't store values that don't belong to the domain that you intended. How do we fix opaque data types? I created a... Um, I think I talked about... Um, the opaque uh, data type issues um, that SQL language is not made to do it, uh, there's limited support, and um, uh, opaque data types uh, and uh, non-domain values are, are hard to deal with and just inject a lot of logic and later on you'll have to undo that or change it or handle it everywhere, it just kind of spiders throughout your organization. So how to fix it? It's pretty simple. It looks cunningly like uh, denormalization uh, templates, uh, except I don't love the word denormalization. Um, you start with a value. You have in your domain something. You need to represent it. You stare at it, and you ask yourself, is it atomic? Is it atomic? Yes. I can map it directly to a SQL data type. If it's so, that's the top branch on the train, then I've won. Let's see if pointer technology works here. So you go in here, is it atomic? Yes, great, good. You just encode it as a SQL native type and you've won. You come in and it's not atomic. And now the question is, what's its, what is its non-atomicity? Is it because it's actually a set of properties? like you took a dictionary and tried to shove it into JSON. If you did that, then this is a key value, really. It's this branch right here. And each key really wants to be a column. The way to represent things in a SQL database is assigning a column with a proper data type, non-opaque. So you take each one of the keys, you turn it into a column name, and you stare at the value but you're not done, because that value in itself, you have to look at it and ask yourself again, is it atomic? Yes, okay, I've won, I'm done with my column. No, it's not, okay, well, ask yourself again, is it a dictionary with keys and values, in which case you wanna break it, or is it a sequence of items? Maybe you have an array masquerading as XML or something like that. Or maybe you have a train of values represented uh, by some buffer or something like that, and they are actually an array or a set of things. So then the answer there is, well, if it's a set of things, since columns in SQL better be atomic, that means I need a different table. So it's going to become a column in another table with a reference back to the parent table. 
So that's my algorithm there. Make sense? Any questions on that? Okay. Which brings us to error two. I see a lot. Multi-entity table. Multi-entity table is a generalized table. It's a table that wants to store kind of the parent or the base and also all its children in one row. And the thing about it is that you can see it when you see rows which have either patterned or unpatterned columns that are always null for some rows and not null for others. And they interleave with rows that are null for others but not for some. Okay, it's hard to say it in English. Let's look at an example. Here we have a table of a catalog item. A catalog item in my catalog has a SKU, SKU, something, a code that represents that in my company, a name, every catalog item, it's a shirt, it's pants, it's something, and it has numeric size and letter size. And if I looked at values for this table, I probably would see that I have, you know, SKU, ABC, T-shirt, size M, and size M will have <coughs> numeric size, uh, sorry, letter size populated in numeric size uh, null. Versus I'll have, you know, pants with size 32, and um, then I'll have the letter size null and the name. So I can kind of look at it and see, okay, well, the generalization here is that I have a table, and there's a generality that all items have a SKU and a name, but then I have some properties, some columns, that are valid for some stuff but not other. And that's because I have products that are inherently different in the real world. In the real world, I find a shirt and it has an M on the back, or I have a shirt or a top that has a size numeric on the back, and they're kind of different. They're cut different, they're manufactured different, they're aimed at different people. So they are really different. But I made them live together in one table. So the way to kind of fix this is to say, well, I have a catalog item. I still want to be generic. There could be catalog items corresponding to different uh, things in the real world. But then I have my numeric size catalog items, and I shortened the name of the table here, but those are numeric sized things, and they have a numeric size. And then I have a letter size, and uh, that lives in a different table. So I'm not going to have null in the letter size ever. A catalog item that happened to be letter sized will have a relationship to this table, and if I join it, it will come out not null and vice versa. And if I ever wanted a view that joined both of them, or all three tables, then I would have a flat thing, but I will have it in different columns. And I will know what to expect because I did this. Right? I know very easily that this is um, uh, an item that has a letter size because it will have a school, a school for letter size dot school and a letter, uh, letter size dot letter size coming back in my joined uh, expression to show me what it is. So the database doesn't have to think hard. If it was more like it was on the left, I will need to uh, expose logic um, everywhere to tell if this row happens to be wanting to represent things in one way or another, or I will have to package it as an opaque data type. That's where people do type as string and just says, oh, I'll just do size and it'll be a var binary and let the application worry about it. Well, great, but then what? If you want to sort shirts by size, well, you know, your size 30, 40 will sort correctly maybe, or maybe lexicographically and incorrectly, and surely, you know, uh, S, M, L, XL, double XL, all of those uh, extra small will sort weirdly. 
So it's just not good for anyone, really, to, to do OPEC or to have these nulls. Either way, it kind of messes you up. Onwards. Um, this one is about abnormal form, which means I failed to uh, do my uh, process for storing things atomically and uh, in their proper tables. So I have my table enrollment here. And enrollment in my university has um, people with a first name and a last name. And I place, uh, a, I have a placeholder for the scores for the exams. Uh, and, uh, you know, the course belongs to a certain major. Ma no, it's not the course, it's the uh, professor, and uh, there's a course itself, what the course code is, and a teacher, and an assistant, and stuff like that. So a bunch of things smell here. Let's uh, kind of go through them. Um, the first thing is I'm limited to the number of exams that can occur in a semester or a quarter or whatever system, right? Because I chose to pivot this and just put the exams right there. So where should it have been? A different table, that's right. And then if exam, uh, final exam hasn't occurred yet, there will be no row. It's not like I have a placeholder because I know I have it, it just doesn't exist at this point. Um, in this, I will have nulls often because I fixed the columns, uh, which means that as time goes by, uh, I will start filling in the exam scores, and if somebody missed an exam, uh, it will forever be null. Also, some of my courses uh, just have a teacher, a professor, some of them have a teaching assistant, but that means that rows that there is no teacher assistant forever will have null in there. So we talked about that, that's silly. Um, we have a fixed faculty assignment, which means for extremely uh, large classes, I might not be able to accommodate another TA, another teacher assistant. Um, I might be duplicating data when I see these kind of things. There's usually another table which represents the teacher elsewhere. So instead of using reference properly to just say, well, here's a teacher, go join if you need their name or whatever the primary key was. Um, that, uh, that uh, is probably duplicating data, which means at some point there's issues of maintaining consistency between this table and the other one. Um, and you're trying to predict the future. You're trying to predict that this you know, student will actually complete the course. You're trying to predict that you will need to accommodate teacher's assistance. You're trying to do all kinds of things, all kinds of assumptions that may not actually bear in reality. So the effects of that, um, you will have sparse columns. That's the ones with nulls that may forever be null, may just uh, populate over time. Uh, it can decrease your flexibility in case I wanted to play with how many TAs and things happen. Um, it may negate the join engine, uh, the engine uh, join optimizations uh, where um, I have um, um, uh, the, the, the query optimizers know how to look at the statistics of indexes and see which query it should do first if I joined you know, all of my students into courses. It knows which one has more rows and knows how to do it faster if it gets right statistics. But when you have null columns, it doesn't. It just has to kind of guess as to which of the values in the index you're going to hit, and it's difficult for it to do without actually scanning the index. And as a result, you will have indexes that need to contain references to all of um, the values in the columns. So even if you have nulls, uh, some engines will still keep index keys on it or reference to uh, rows with the null value, and that increases the overall index size. Whereas if it was in a side table and there's only you know, 10 TAs in the whole school, well, the index size will be 10 entries. 
And uh, depending on your engine, locks and things like that will also creep up. So as you update tables that are multi-entity or that are of abnormal form, um, you will find that uh, write lock contentions at a higher level, like at the table instead of just row locks, will start creeping up because everything you write is into the table. Whereas if you just wanted to add a teacher's assistant in a teacher's assistant table, you're locking there. So now you made all the locks kind of uh, compete in this table space. So that's about it, and the queries complex point uh, is, is kind of similar here, and the multi-entity table, which is um, that queries need to bifurcate. Am I querying here because I'm trying to hit the teacher and what they teach, or the student, or something, and they need to deal with the nullability of certain fields, and say, is this person not doing this exam, or the exam hasn't passed yet? We don't know. Uh, the exam date hasn't arrived yet, sorry. So logic will creep in and be spread everywhere. Um, this is my attempt at humor. Thank you. Thank you for your grace on this. Um, let's talk uh, keys. Let's talk references. Um, so in the world of uh, keys, um, there's what's called a natural key. And a natural key is something that I can see in the real world. So a natural key, whatever I observe in the outside world in my model, it exists in the model, then it could be natural. If it doesn't exist in the model, it is probably not natural. Now, natural doesn't mean that it's always non-assigned. So if I have an agency that issued the ISO two-letter code, Effectively, it's a natural key of countries because it's part of a real business world. It's something that an authority took over, and it might be an authority of mine, right? I may be Twitter, and I may be issuing or allowing for usernames or handles or whatever system we have, and that becomes a natural key because I manage it. It's a thing, so if it's, if it's a thing, then it still kind of belongs in the natural key part of things. Most importantly, it's meaningful, and then it's part of the model. It exists outside of my database. Artificial keys are meaningful. They're known in the real world, but they're kind of foreign to the entity itself. So countries, in a domain of country, and if I, my entity was country, that's a natural key. But if it's me and my citizenship, my citizenship is not me. I'm a person, I'm attached to a citizenship, it's foreign to the me, it's associated, it's still, it's artificial, but it's still observable in some way, shape, or form associated in the real world. And now we go a little further in the rabbit hole don't slip and fall like the guy in the icon, we have exposed locators. And exposed locators are things that are in the database, but not in the real world. So those are primary keys. Uh, let's say um, something that's uh, a row ID, um, an exposed row ID, so like an identity column, a UUID that I assigned as a primary key, a something, a sequence. Those are things that are meaningful only to the database engine. But I can't go up to a person and say, oh, you're one, two, three, four. Yeah, yeah. Like, there's no, I like pat him down. There's no one, two, three, four anywhere in the pockets. There's just doesn't exist. It's just an artifact of the database. Which means a lot of times it's also an artifact of that database instance, like on that machine. It's not everywhere, which means I will have drift in other environments and things like that if I try to replicate. I might have collisions if it was generated by two different uh, systems, things like that. And those are exposed locators. The exposed part here is that it's visible, meaning I can somehow interact with it from my program. There's a worse class, which is the real surrogate key. Um, and these are ones that are not exposed. 
So as you can imagine, internally databases have identifiers for the blocks or for the row or things like that that are not even exposed to the programmers. And some systems kind of let you use them uh, by using special functions and saying, hey, which version of this row do you have? And it will give you a long, ugly number and says, this is you know, storage related. So that's very crusty stuff. Don't use that ever for uh, primary keys. So using meaningless keys is the error here. Uh, if you're using meaningless keys, things that don't participate in the real world, either, either being artificial or being just not part of the real world, not natural in any way, shape, or form, you are really... Um, making everything more complicated. Um, the number of joins you'll need to do, let's say I have country ID 3 on my UI, I can't say what this country ID is. Andorra, Angola, I, I forget, but you know, I, I don't know, right? If I ever want a country code or if I ever want its name, I would have to join to another table in order to get it. If you use natural keys, and my natural key say is this ISO 2 letter code or the name of the country or ISO 3, then it's always there in my column already. It already answers this question. And if I wanted to filter, I could filter through this. Yes, sir? What do you do when natural keys change? Yeah, so there will be an impact, and the impact on the change of the natural key will be judged by how we look at the impact of change. So would that be a type change? No, it would be a domain change, right? It would be a uh, change in the value universe of that domain. Um, and in case that it's additive, it's kind of similar to uh, just adding a column that nobody used before. And in case it's a change because it's primary key, I think the gentleman is hinting at the fact that primary keys need a property of immutability or rare changiness, and uh, that would have cascading effect, which means it's harder. Yeah. But harder does not mean don't ever do it. Harder means what is my main use case scenario for 99% of the time, right? Um, yeah, so good point, and I will judge it by the effort, the pain it will cause me in the future. The thing is, I always have to join, always, 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 when I use a surrogate key or exposed identifier. I always have to do it. So it permeated through the whole thing. And I said, oh, well, they're using identity column. That's fine, right? But everywhere in my joins, everywhere, join, 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 join. And I'm like, oh, that's OK. And I'm like, oh my god, there's a new ISO letter code or a country split. Happens. It's like, happens once, once in five years. It's not everywhere. Yeah, it affects a lot of things, but eh. So where, where am I going to have more pain? That's kind of my question. Uh, I'll take more questions later. Let me um, continue on here. Um, so it increases the number of joint tables. Great example, by the way. Uh, increases the number of indexes because now, because I have joins, every foreign key will need an index on the referencing table. Um, so it will increase that, increase the number of objects uh, because I will need uh, that index, I will need that extra table. Uh, it may be sometimes I can have a domain represented already there. So what if country code is used for addresses and used for citizenships. Do I need another table to just say, oh my god, uh, these are country codes, I better have a table for country codes? Or can I use a constraint that says, hey, in this country, we only allow this array of items and use a check constraint or use something else, another mechanism to enforce that domain and not use domain tables. It's also possible. Um, the clustering indexing efficiency has to do with, um, with it, the exact engine. So SQL Server has this thing called uh, uh, clustered index. Uh, other databases 
don't quite do it this way, so uh, your mileage may vary there. Uh, what would happen is when you're issuing sequences uh, for the primary key, when you're writing, each write by definition is just one number higher, which means you kind of write into the table at the end of the table. And if you're updating it frequently, that creates a hot spot. Um, other technologies might have other effects by this. So um, it, it kind of, this is a place where you want to really learn about your specific database and how these things behave. Uh, speaking of which, that's the next slide is sequential primary key, auto-generated keys. And uh, sequences are surrogate keys. Sequences are not meaningful in the uh, real world. They're just invented things that I somehow glued to my object and um, because of that they suffer all of the things we already uh, discussed. Uh, they're hi hard to migrate among systems, so that happened to me a lot where on day one you're in developer land, on week two you're in production. Yeah, we threw things in production after two weeks. Um, and then, you know, on year three, we want to simulate all the real problems we have in production. So we ask the DBAs, hey, bring us back all the data from production into UAT or some area in order for us to simulate and run our software on real data because our backend system as developers don't have all this data and some of the conditions and things we want to check is on a variety of real world data. But then we kind of have to keep resetting everything according to production, sanitize, things like that, because there's collision with those keys. And when you have more than one system, then these keys that are meaningless migrate into other systems and they're not in sync anymore. Because this you know, person's country ID says, oh, you know, give me a list of this country ID in another system, and at the other system, that country ID has already changed. Because it's meaningless, it now collides with uh, an, a different uh, value, a different row altogether. So it's harder to keep in sync. Um, hotspot risks we uh, spoke about, and uh, the drift among environments uh, can cause a lot, of, um, a lot of havoc on its own. Also discourages schema migration, so uh, that will come up in a later slide, but I'll talk a little bit about schema migrations. So sequential primary keys are essentially exposed locators. Um, most people don't talk about the difference between exposed locators and uh, surrogate keys, so we'll call it surrogate key to adhere with the world. So what I want from a primary key, I want it to be familiar. I want it to be something that somebody knowing the domain will say, oh yeah, yeah I get this. Right? An email address, a username, fine. Sometimes a number is okay if that number means something. Maybe it's your ID number, national ID, something like that. It's okay. You want it to be stable, as a gentleman stated. Um, if things change, what then? Well, yeah, if things change, we'll need to make changes. The question is, how rare is it? So when we say it's stable, we don't mean immutable forever. We mean mostly immutable. Uh, so mostly immutable means that sometimes it will change under very rare condition, and then we'll have to deal with it. Most relational databases, also a lot of the NoSQL databases, require you to keep to require, uh, not require, impose that the primary key is immutable. Those that support transactions allow you to change that value under a cover of a transaction, which means you basically delete the old row, insert a new row in its place with a change value under one transaction cover. The operation can be long running if there's a lot of dependencies or pretty short. Uh, but in any event, we expect that it is rare. So meaningful, uh, rarely changes, and convenient. It's simple and compact. So don't ask me about 
how to represent people because it's first name, first name, last name, middle. Oh, there's a collision. What else can I do? Can I pat people down? Do I put their DNA sequence into the ID? No, that's a tougher one to answer. But typically, it comes with something. I'm making a system for the immigration services. Okay, it has to do with IDs. It has to do with some other uh, external IDs that I can attach to it and make it a something, right? Or I make my own. I say, hey, your email address is you. I don't care what your name is. Your email address is you. And you are the recipient of all of those change passwords. So this is you for all intents and purposes. Or a username or something like that. And then we don't want it to be too many elements. We want it to be somewhat compact so it's convenient. We want it simple uh, so we don't have to deal with a lot of logic to have multiple, you know, 10 column primary key is kind of gnarly and it appears again and again and again in all your queries so we want it as simple as possible and now we switch abruptly to not talking about the database so much but talking about development and development practices and this is where ORM comes into play and as a developer I loved ORM I love the ORM idea the first time I saw it. Um, then I went to production. Um, so the trouble with ORM is that tables are not classes. Tables are the language, that proprietary SQL language that describes the schema, which has to do with the data layout, which the engines are then optimized to deal with and answer for. But they're not classes. In a class, I don't have pointers to other things like foreign keys. It's just a class. It has properties. It's all in memory as some contiguous something, typically. And the database is not a repo pattern. And ORMs kind of encourage the repo pattern, which is like, oh, I have an entity, like invoices. OK, well, that's my class invoice. And the class has an array of invoice items. Each one has a SKU and a quantity. Maybe I copy in the title of the name or something. Who cares? And it also has a customer, which is a reference to you know, something. So what the ORM will happily do is just go and spider all of the tables, because you know, SKU items, uh, items are many for one invoice. I have a table and I have a relationship and it will traverse it and do the whole thing. And, and it will produce just gnarly uh, queries in order to do this. And then when I say, okay, on top of this a repo, essentially what I'm saying is suck up all of this data into memory and let me in memory iterate it as if it's uh, some kind of loop. Well, that will be either chatty, like get me the next one, the next one, the next one with all the joins, or it will be chunky, like load everything into memory and let me do it into memory, in memory. Either one of those is a heavy operation. And the database engine can't really help you, so it just gets gnarly queries, executes them on your behalf, and tries to deserialize everything. And then the cost of serializing is also present, uh, deserializing from the database. So I don't like the database repo uh, kind of mentality. Uh, database is a repo mentality that is imposed through using an ORM. Um, you have a diminished benefit from the ORM, in my experience, in that you start with, you know, oh, entity framework, oh, forward generate a schema, or backwards generate a schema. My DBA did a good job. Let me just suck it in, generate classes. Either way, this is great for week one. Hey, Nuri, did you manage to start the project? Oh, yeah, I have working code. Now put it in production, and for the next five years, you're going to fight it. All of those decisions, you have a static class, not a static. You have a class that got declared. If you want to make any changes, it has cascading impact into the database because now you have to forward generate tables and you have to do migrations according to how the ORM saw it. Vice versa, also, same thing. You change it in the database, now you have to change the classes that are essentially the DTO of your database, right? They are classes representing the schema. And it's not exactly the class you wanted. It's a class that got derived because the ORM said so. That's not how I like to live my life. 
you'll have concurrency issues because the repo model, the repo mentality, makes you think of the invoice as a single thing. But then if you want to change the invoice, you're not thinking about just changing the element. And if you change just a line item and change the quantity, the object that was in memory that was the whole invoice and mapped to a class that you have at your disposal are not in sync. So you have to do things like concurrency tracking, change tracking, uh, doing all kinds of back and forth to see if it changed before you write it, all kinds of stuff like that, which would not be necessary if you went directly. Um, and finally, um, it's once it's established, not finally, I kind of mentioned it, once you establish the entity to class mapping, it's, it's kind of costly to change it. And it's kind of opaque to change it. You make these changes and you know a lot of things happen in the background and chasing it everywhere becomes difficult. So Nuri, do you really think ORMs have no place? Well, no, I'm a consultant. Of course, it depends. <laughs> So the things I say maybe ORMs are helpful are in the arena of um, connection management. It brings you some benefit that you don't have to do it on your own, uh, hide some connection pools, or contains a connection pooling and uh, kind of instant singleton instance that you can deal with, or multiple injectable items that map to the same underlying infrastructure. Not the lousiest idea. Maybe that's a useful thing. Uh, it does the codec work of mapping between the tabular data format that came from the wire into SQL types and into C sharp types. I like that. that. That's a good thing, right? If I could get a bunch of stuff, a bunch of tables, and automatically marry them to my, um, marry them to my, to my classes, I, I kind of like this. But I really don't like the command marshalling. The fact that I have to go through the ORM just to call stored procedures, functions, things like that. Um, personally, it just makes no sense to me. You could use the driver. The driver actually does it, not the ORM. So use the driver directly. Um, the abstractions it provides, such as repo patterns and stuff like that, seem nice. But you know, after week two, I usually just fight against the ORM instead of enjoying it. So. That tells me it's not that useful. And uh, change detection, concurrency uh, handling, and all of that, I just, that, that is something that I really uh, resent every time I encounter. It's just not, not fun. And then the last one uh, we'll talk about here, number seven, uh, is ad hoc DDL. So the notion of uh, going and just adding a column by hand. Uh, that, you know, I've seen DBAs do this. I've seen various degrees of, of responsibility around it. The problem with manual changes to DDL or creation is that it's not very repeatable or not reliably repeatable. Uh, you can't automate this. Uh, you can't play this again in every environment. And you can't sometimes tell what happened if you don't have a good record of who made the action, who changed things, uh, how are you going to know when trouble comes, how come it was working yesterday and not working today? Like, what is the change? When did it happen? Who did it? For what purpose? We don't know any of this. And the foregone conclusion is, well, you know, use migration scripts. So you can use, uh, you know, Flyway, Liquibase, whatever your system supports or you love using, uh, if you're not using any of those, please uh, read up and uh, uh, look at it. The nice thing about migration scripts is you store them as files. Um, the frameworks themselves let you just play it. You can play it on demand. Many of them support the notion of rollback, so if you made a mistake, you can revert. Uh, having it in automation, CI, CD, I'm sure we've all talked about in the last 10 years. So. This is what enables you to do CI, CD with databases. Uh, highly recommended. Um, and that's about it. Uh, so my advice in summary is all just uh, use natural keys to the degree possible. Use the database how it was intended to be used, which is store atomic values, normalize to the degree possible concise data types for what you're trying to represent and not wishy-washy things like 
JSON and XML shoved in a relational database. Come to my Mongo later if you want to talk about documents. My Mongo talk later. Uh, ORMs, not my favorite at all. Uh, and if you've ever had to fight your ORM and go below it and just hand it a statement, you know that the ORM didn't help you. You know it inside, right? Okay. So that is it. I'll take questions. We have a couple minutes, uh, or we don't have minutes. Okay. In case we can't use natural keys, like a meaningful key, would you recommend using a So the question is, and uh, don't feel obligated to sit down. It's past time here. Um, in the case of nat if natural keys don't work, would I recommend using a non-natural key. So synthetic, yes. Uh, exposed identifier or surrogate. Surrogate, it's, it's almost impossible to use pure surrogate, but um, I, I would recommend against it in many all cases. In other words, invent yourself. If, if nobody else, if there's no authority that lets you identify something, then you are the authority. And if you are the authority, maybe own up to it and become the authority on that. Like that is what a SKU is, right? A stop, stock keeping unit, no other manufacturer could tell me what the item number is because their item numbers are private to them. I'm the big shop that sells from many manufacturers and they could collide. So I assigned it a stock keeping unit which is a number on the shelf of how I keep it. So I became the authority to that. Otherwise I would have to say galvanize, screw, you know, M3, and I would not be able to distinguish it. So how do I distinguish, dis disambiguate it? With a SKU that's completely synthetic, or with a dash manufacturer number, or with a something, I become the authority for that, and I store it. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, enjoy the rest of the...